Let's start off with the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28 verse 19. Go in therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I repeat from verse 19. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is what we call the Magna Mandemos, the great mandate that Jesus gave to the church. From the passage read, we discover the three purposes of the church. The church of Christ on earth exists for three things. The church of Christianity exists to do three things on earth, what we refer to as the purpose of the church. And because I have given the teaching already, which is in our YouTube channel already, I will not go in details, but what we see there, the first injunction is to make disciples of all nations, to evangelize the world. The next thing is integration, to baptize the people into the food, into the body of Christ, into Christianity. Why the third thing is to groom them by teaching them. So the first one is evangelism, the second one is baptism, and the third one is catechism. Evangelism, baptism, catechism. And it goes in that priority. The first one is the outreach, reaching out to souls, evangelization. The second one is integration. And the third one is stabilization. When we go out and reach out to souls, when they respond to the message, the, 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 the kerygma, the dynamic proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ, when they respond, they are now integrated into the body of Christ through baptism. And once they have become one in the body, as they have become Christians, then they need to grow. And that's the place of grooming them or stabilizing them in the faith, which is where catechism, or what is also known as secondary evangelization, comes in. That is what the church exists. So, this is just a, prior, a preamble. Today, we want to look at the topic titled New Evangelization. New Evangelization. And what is the aim of this teaching? One is to expose the needs to the church's stand or the stand of the church on the new evangelization. That is the course I am taking in our school of maximum impact. And this is the aim to expose the students or the trainees to proper understanding of the church's stand on new evangelization. The second of the aim is to provide the necessary information as per the formation and the techniques for the new evangelization. All they need to know about the formation and the techniques of the new evangelization. Now, now this is what our outline is going to look like, what the Greek course are domination, no, I mean who want to process. The Englishman calls it an impression. That means an outline of what we are going to be looking at in the course of our teaching on new evangelization. Number one is the church and the concept of evangelization. The church and the concept of evangelization. 
The next one is the church and the concept of new evangelization. Then we talk about what exactly is evangelization. Then we look at the background to new evangelization. Then we look at the spirituality of new evangelization. Then we look at Acts 2 process of evangelization. Then we look at new evangelization techniques. Then we look at the eight elements of evangelization. And we wrapped up with what is known as the kerygma of today. This is what we shall be looking at. All right, <clears throat> the church and the concept of evangelization. Pope Paul VI established the Synod of Bishops at the end of the Second, Second Vatican Council, that is Vatican II, to help out with church administration. And this council meets every three years to formulate policies and discuss issues and chart the course for the church. In 1974, the Synod met and deliberated on the theme of evangelization. The, the, the theme for their meeting in 1974 was on evangelization. Thereafter, the Pope published the outcome of the Synod in 1975 in a document called Evangelii Nusiandi. Evangelii Nusiandi, the Latin, uh, is a Latin word for announcing the good news. Announcing the good news, which was 10 years after the Second Vatican Council. 10 years after the Second Vatican Council. That is what we talk about the church and the concept of evangelization. What exactly is evangelization that we are talking about? It's important we look at it. Now, according to this document, Evangelii Nusiandi, evangelization is the totality of the church's effort in bringing the good news to humanity and providing the vehicle for the nourishment and the sustenance of the people. The church's effort in bringing the good news to every strata of humanity and providing the vehicle equally for the nourishment and the sustenance of the people. Meaning, not just to evangelize, but to groom. But it starts with evangelization. That simply tells us that evangelization ends in the church, when the people have become members. And once that happens, cat cases take up from where the primary evangelization has stopped. Evangelization, evangelization comes from the Greek evangelizo. Evangelization comes from the Greek evangelizo. Evangelizo simply means to bring good news, to convey a joyful message, to convey a good news, or to bring a joyful news to people. Evangelist New Sunday number 18 says that evangelization is bringing the good news into every strata of humanity and that this evangelization began with the kerygma of Jesus Christ. It began with the kerygma of Jesus Christ when he started his ministry according to the, uh, the gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter 1 verse 15. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was the preaching, the kerygma or the preaching of Jesus calling people to the good news of the kingdom. That the kingdom that man lost is at hand, has returned to man, has returned to earth. It's not a matter of man accepting it. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's no longer far, even though it was lost. As we saw in Genesis chapter 3, Jesus is saying that what was lost has been found, has been recovered, has been restored. And that is good news. So it started with Jesus. And then the apostles continued where Jesus started, restored, to continue to release this good news of the kingdom of God. So new evangelization, why is it called new? Actually dates back 
to the Vatican II era between 1963 and 1966. Before Vatican II, the church uses only one language. The church of God was so legalistic, too many laws. Only one language is employed. That is Latin. In fact, if the priest is to celebrate Mass, he celebrates the Mass with his back on the people. He faces the altar and his back is on the people. Too many laws. That was Vatican I. But Vatican II came to relax many aspects of the celebration and the church's liturgical life. Music was not part of the worship as at Vatican I. It was so legalistic and there was no dialogue. Once you don't believe, you are declared anathema. Anathema seat, an outcast, right? to be rejected, to be cast out. No, no room for dialogue. But Vatican II brought in theology. God brought in dialogue and the relaxation. In fact, Pope John the Twenty Third, who convened the Second Vatican Council, brought the church to a new dimension. In his letter of invitation to the bishops, for the Vatican Council, he asked them, will you prepare for this council by reading the Acts of the Apostles? Will you prepare for this council by reading the Acts of the Apostles? With this, he announced the Second Vatican Council, stressing the need to open the doors and the windows of the church for fresh air to come in telling us that the church of God is to be dynamic. He sealed that letter of summons with the word, a Latin word called adjournamento. And adjournamento means updating, updating. The church of God is not supposed to be static, for God himself is not static. He is to be progressing and to be dynamic. And so he asked them that there, there was need to open the doors and the windows of the church such that fresh air will come in. Although Pope Paul XXIII died before the council commenced, the Second Vatican Council commenced, but Pope Paul VI took over from him and then ushered in the new era of evangelization. Evangelization actually, according to the church, is committed to the magisterium. And the magisterium is the teaching office of the church. That's why the church is said to be apostolic, because it was handed over to the apostles. So the teaching office is the apostolic succession. It's more or less a leadership team, even though the Bible encourages everyone to do the work of the evangelists. So let's look at the magisterium and evangelization. The magisterium and evangelization. 25 years after the Second Vatican Council and 15 years after the publishing of Evangelii Nusendi, that is in the year 1990, Pope St. John Paul II continued. He said, in agreement with the magisterial teaching of my predecessors, I now invite the church to renew her missionary life. I now invite the church to renew her missionary life. And this he did with the publication of a document called the uh, Redemptoris Missio. The Redemptoris Missio is the, Latin, is the Latin for the mission of the Redeemer. He called the church to renew her missionary mandate, her missionary life, her missionary activity. I'm also calling upon you, even as you listen to the sound of my voice, even as you watch this teaching, renew your missionary life, renew your missionary mandate, because that is why we exist. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. We are all sent, we are all on mission, on bringing the good news of the kingdom to every whom strata of humanity. So, in case we are become, you are becoming redundant, this is a wake-up call for renewal of our missionary life. In 1982, the same Pope, Jean Paul II, visited Nigeria and he spoke of a new era of evangelization. A new era of evangelization. In 
1983, he went to Haiti and spoke of an evangelization that is new in zeal, new in method, and new in expression. New in zeal, new in method, and new in expression. And he said that that was what he had in mind by a new era of evangelization. So he is actually the principal protagonist of new evangelization. He is the principal protagonist of new evangelization. So with the launching of this call for new evangelization came many initiatives in the church, like the formation of the schools of evangelization the formation of the schools of evangelization, which gave rise to Emmaus School of Evangelization in Yuseluku Delta State here in Nigeria in 1989, which serves as headquarters from where other schools of evangelization had emanated, are emanating to other parts of the nation. Because the vision is that every diocese is supposed to have the school of evangelization. Then also the new evangelization magazine, Tesho Millennio Advenento. Tesho Millennio, Millennio Advenento means the advent of the third millennium. And also the formation of the NAS New Evangelization Sisters. Or as a result of the call of the Holy Father for a new era of evangelization. After the Synod in Rome, the Pope came to Cameroon and gave us what is known as Ecclesia in Africa. Ecclesia in Africa. That was in 1966. I mean in 1996. Ecclesia in Africa, the theme being the church in Africa and her evangelizing mission towards the year 2000. You shall be my witnesses the church in Africa and her evangelization mission towards the year 2000 you shall be my witnesses that was where the slogan was Jesus for all by the year 2000 Jesus for all by the year 2000 five points of interest we are being summarized as a community of the African Synod of 1996 Ecclesia in Africa one, proclamation. Two, dialogue. Three, inculturation. Four, justice, development, and peace. And then five, means of social communication. These are part of the things that Pope said that Africa loves music. And so that music should be part of the African worship, not as solemn as it used to be out there. A new, many other things were incorporated. Inculturation, carrying the people along through their culture, even though we saw bastardization or abuse of it, that people are now taking local titles in the church and they call it Christian also. You'll be wearing a robe like the old village people that are taking also in, in the church. Inculturation has to do with looking at the good aspects of what the people do and carry them along in it because Christianity is not supposed to be strange, but Christianity is supposed to be what? A direction, a light that others should be followed, not to go and follow others. Many people don't understand the meaning of inculturation. Culture is a way of life, but there are some cultures that are demonic. There are some cultures that are ungodly. There are some cultures that don't have Christian value. They are not meaningless. The people may value it, but it doesn't have any significance. So it doesn't mean that everything should be you know, important, good client and uh, sinker. Let's look at the spirituality of new evangelization. Spirituality of new evangelization. The word, the word or the key word the key word in evangelization is kerygma. And kerygma means the dynamic proclamation of the word of God boldly. Bold declaration of the word of God. It also means to proclaim the word under the influence or leadership of the Holy Spirit about Jesus Christ, the word incarnate. 
the Kedgma is the bold declaration of the word of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit about the Lord Jesus Christ who is the word incarnate. In Kerygma, we proclaim to say, we proclaim to say, we proclaim to inform. Kerygma is about releasing the word in order to invoke response of commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is primary evangelization, inviting people into the kingdom by submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Why, when you talk of catechesis, is about a kind of training of those who are already in the faith, a calculated, you know, step-by-step -step guide on how to grow onto maturity. One is about being born, the other one is about growing, having received the life. All right. What then do we preach? What do we preach? The love of God as seen in the parable of the prodigal son, as recorded in Evangelium Secundum Lucam, the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, from verse 11 to 32. The love of the Father as personified in the parable of the lost son, meaning in God's kingdom, everyone is welcome. God's arms are always wide open to welcome, to embrace, to receive everyone, no matter who they are, as long as they can desire to be in the kingdom. For God created his kingdom to share it with man, to share it with you, to when the prodigal retraced himself, his steps, and began his journey towards whom his father ran to welcome him. God is ever ready ever willing to welcome you, to welcome anyone who will willingly come to him and submit to him and desire his kingdom. So Jesus preached the love of the Father and the kingdom of God. Ninety over, almost 98 percent of all the time that Jesus opened his mouth to talk, he talked about the love of the Father. He talked about the love of the Father and the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. What Jesus preached is the kingdom. And that is what we are supposed to preach. Jesus preached the kingdom, but he did not emphasize heaven. The kingdom of God has two parts. It's made up of the spiritual and the physical. That means the heaven and the earth. While heaven is the spiritual place for God and his angels, the earth is the place for man. Jesus preached the kingdom. He did not measure on heaven. He preached the kingdom. Now today's preachers go in the opposite direction. We preach heaven. We don't measure on the kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom. He did not concentrate in on about heaven. Why do these preachers preach on heaven and don't concentrate on the kingdom? The kingdom of God is to be shared with man and that is the physical part of the kingdom and that is the earth part of the kingdom and therefore it is important that we understand but because of a package is coming when we talk about exactly what are we to preach and we just not go into details. Oh, yeah. So it is important we understand that Jesus preached the kingdom but did not emphasize on heaven and in the opposite way preachers of today emphasize on heaven and they don't preach the kingdom. That is the point of what we are sent to preach as he was saying, say, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. All right, let us round up by looking at the three characteristics. The three characteristics of new evangelization. Number one, new in zeal. New in zeal. It calls for limitless zeal, enthusiasm, such that one is not willing to be stopped 
That means it is brought about by the action of the Holy Spirit, which the Evangelist Lucendi, number 75, says is the principal agent of evangelization. New in zeal, meaning that you don't, in fact, it is like a priority, just like Jesus said, where the premium regular day, seek first the kingdom of God. You see it as a first thing that you put, concentrate your energy in. In fact, in First Corinthians chapter 9, St. Paul had to say, Woe is me if I don't preach this gospel. Woe is me. I am on that course. I am doomed. I am finished. If I don't preach, you see it as a priority. New in zeal. Let our zeal be awakened. Let our zeal be awakened for the sake of the kingdom basic dissemination. Two, new in the method. New in the method. To be able to reach souls, different methods are employed, like drama, in contact with part of why inculturation is part of the Ecclesia in Africa. How to reach out. So we look at different methods, drama, inculturation, the print and social media. We begin to look at different ways. Thank God today, YouTube. Many of you will be listening to this without even knowing me, without having come to see me. Why? Because we are devising many methods to share the good news. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, many of them. And that is exactly what the Pope was conversing. And then finally, new in expression. New in expression. Different approach to evangelization. The Latin says, the more that word not happened, that was what led to the introduction of life industry seminars in the schools of evangelization. Before you, if you go to the uh, school of evangelization, you will not pass out without experiencing or undergoing the life industry seminar, both the laity and the clergy as well. Why? To renew our missionary mandate, our expression, our understanding, our motivation, our dynamism for the kingdom. And that is what exactly is uh, the new in expression aspect of the dynamics or characteristics of new evangelization. Meaning that we have to be cheerful or cheerfulness in communication and appearance, being led by the Spirit, being guided by the Spirit, being enthusiastically dynamic, and so on and so forth. That means we need to understand that what we are giving people is good news, which is known as the Easter message. And we don't have to give the Easter message with a Good Friday face. It is a call for new expression. And my prayer is that the grace of God we continue to sustain us, to renew our missionary mandate because souls are perishing. The world is getting wicked, more wicked on a daily basis. The devil and his demons are recruiting souls and believers we don't need to sit and fold our hand, arms as if all is well, for all is not well. Wake up and do the work and all glory will return to our Father God. Per Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen.